ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله تعالى من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له له الملك وله الحمد يحيي ويميت يعز ويذل بيده الخير وهو على كل شيء قدير وأشهد أن محمدًا عبده ورسوله وصفيه من خلقه وحبيبه بلغ الرسالة وأدى الأمانة ونصح الأمة وكشف الله به الغمة وجاهد في الله حق جهاده حتى أتاه اليقين فصلوات الله وسلامه عليه وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد فإن أصحق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر المول محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار يقول الله تعالى يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما ثم أما بعد We praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala We glorify him We thank him And we send our peace and blessings on his final messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam And his companions and all those who followed him until the last day uh, It has become uh, widely believed uh, around this time that the Prophet ﷺ undertook one of the, if not, or actually the greatest, the greatest journey that has ever been performed in the history of mankind, in the history of creation. It is widely believed that this journey, known as Al Isra wal Mi'raj, occurred on the 27th night of Rajab, which, uh, according to the calendars, might have been last night or tonight, depending on the difference of the calendars. And this has become uh, widely known and widely believed, although the scholars have differed when is actually this uh, event happened. Was it during the month of Rajab? Was it during the month of Rabi'ul Awwal? Or was it some other time? Uh, but this uh, night, 27th of Rajab, has become, has become known, widely known to be the night in which Rasulullah was taken on this magnific magnificent journey. So while we don't know exactly when it happened, we know for sure that it did happen. And this is because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has informed us in the Quran that it happened. And this journey is mentioned in two surahs. And it is a two-part journey. First, when Rasulullah was taken bodily from his house in Mecca all the way to Jerusalem, Allah mentions this at the beginning of Surah Al-Isra. Subhanallah, asra bi abdihi laylam min al masjid al harami ila al masjid al aqsa al ladhi barakna hawla. Glory be to the one who has taken his slave from Masjid al Haram to Masjid al Aqsa, uh, uh, the, the, upon which we have blessed its surroundings. We have blessed its surroundings. Al ladhi barakna hawlahu. And then from Jerusalem, he went all the way up to the heavens. This is known as al Mi'raj. Allah mentions this in Surah Al Najm. Ending off with the verse, لَقَدْ رَآ مِنْ آيَاتِ رَبِّهِ الْكُبْرَى And he saw, indeed, he saw the magnificent signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A summary of those events, Rasulullah sallam was taken. Uh, and before he was taken, the angel came and they opened up his heart. And they opened up his body. And they washed his heart with the water of Zamzam. And they put in it, hikmah, wisdom. And then he was taken on the animal called Al Buraq, an, an animal that is smaller than a horse but bigger than a donkey. And from there he was taken to Jerusalem, Bayt al Maqdis. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect it, and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala free it from oppression, and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect his people and alleviate their hardships and their struggles and their uh, pain. Allahumma ameen. And then in Bayt al Maqdis in Jerusalem, he met with all of the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, thousands and thousands of prophets, and he led them all in the salah. And then from there, he went all the way up to the heavens, starting with the first heaven, and then the second heaven, and then the third heaven, until he got to the seventh heaven, and then beyond the seventh heaven, in the Sidrat al-Muntaha, where he saw 
the furthest lot tree, the furthest of creation. And in there was Jannatul Ma'wa, the Jannah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has promised his believers who obey him and believe in him and fulfill his commands and stay away from his prohibitions. And then he met Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala beyond this. And we know that this is where salah was mandated, was obligated. The Muslims used to pray before, but it was not mandatory until this night where Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam received the command to order your ummah to observe the salah. And we we'll notice uh, Ibn Hajar rahimahullah ta'ala, he mentions that there's a connection here between the beginning of this journey and when Rasulullah sallallahu reaches the height of this journey, which is that at the beginning of this journey, he was purified. The angel came and cut open his chest and washed his heart with the water of Zamzam. And then at the end of the journey, at the height of this journey, he receives the command of salah. The connection there is obvious. Before we pray, what do we do? We make purification, right? We purify ourselves, we make wudu, we make tahara. So Rasulullah SAW was purified. And then he went to receive the command of the salah. And as we all know, this command of salah came 50 times a day, 50 times a day. And Rasulullah SAW accepted this command and as on his way down, he met Musa alayhi salam, who told him, and may Allah have mercy on Musa, he had experience, he knows how people are, how human beings are. And Musa alayhi salam told the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi salam, go back up and tell your Lord that it needs to be reduced. And so he went back up and it was reduced. Five or some marriages mentioned, 10 at a time. He kept going, kept going back and forth. He kept coming back down. Musa alayhi salam tells him, go back up, you need to Ask your Lord to reduce it. Your people will not be able to handle it. Until it came all the way down to five. All the way down to five. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that it's five. But it will be 50 in reward. 50 in reward. So it is as if the entire Isra wal Mi'raj journey was for this particular event, which is receiving the salah, the obligation of salah. And this is what we want to talk about, inshaAllah ta'ala the importance of the salah. As we know, the month of Ramadan is coming up. And when the month of Ramadan comes, fasting is gonna take center stage. Fasting is gonna be on everyone's minds. Everyone is gonna be talking about fasting. But we, we must not also forget what is even more important than fasting, which is the salah. The most important act of worship, the most important pillar of Islam after the shahada. La ilaha illallah Muhammadun Rasulullah. And there's nothing more important after the shahada, testimony of faith, than observing and performing the salah. And it's so important that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought his prophet all the way up to the heavens and beyond to give him this command. He did not suffice with sending Jibreel alayhi salam on earth to give him this command. He personally invited Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam all the way up to receive this command of salah. And this shows the importance of the salah. It is the most important pillar of Islam after the shahada. And it is the first thing, the very first thing that we will be questioned on, on the day of judgment. Very first thing. The very first thing, not second, not third, not tenth, first thing you will be questioned about on the day of judgment is your salah. If a person salah is good, then they will be successful. But if a person's salah is not good and they have shortcomings in the salah and they have failed to perform the salah the way that Allah has ordered us to do so, then they have failed and they will be unsuccessful. Very serious hadith which we need to ponder upon. Very first thing that will be asked about on the day of judgment is the salah. And it is the main ingredient for success. And this is emphasized as well in the Quran. Allah says, Qad aflaha al mu'minun." The believers are indeed successful. And then Allah mentions a number of things by which the believers will attain this success. The very first thing, الَّذِينَ هُمْ فِي صَلَاتِهِمْ خَاشِعُونَ Those who in their salah, they are humbled and concentrated. Very first thing mentioned to, as an ingredient of success is the salah. And the salah is 
where a person is closest to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Aqrabu ma yakunu al-abd wa huwa sajid. The closest that a person will be to their Lord is when they are in sujood, when they are in prostration. And this is an integral part of the salah. Salah is the only obligation, the only pillar of Islam that is never lifted. There's never a time that's going to come as long as you have sane intellect, as long as your mind is functioning, where the salah will, become, will be lifted. No matter what the circumstance is, you must pray. As Rasulullah says in the hadith, Salli qa'iman. This is the default. Pray standing. فَإِلَّمْ تَسْتَطِعْ فَقَعِدًا If you're not able to pray standing, then what must you do? Pray sitting. فَإِلَّمْ تَسْتَطِعْ فَعَلَى جَنْبٍ If you're not able to pray sitting, then pray on your side. Some other hadiths mention, narrations mention, then pray reclining, mustalqiyan. And the scholars have then further deduced, you cannot pray sitting, you cannot pray standing, or you cannot pray sitting, or you cannot pray on your side, or even reclining. Then pray with your eyes, motion with your eyes, to go through the, the motions of the salah. If that's the only thing you can do, you still have obligation to do that. And even if you're, you're, can, you can't move your eyes, pray in your heart, pray in your mind. Salah is never lifted. The salah is always a something that is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is expecting us to perform. And we see the seriousness of this in the fact that even in the battlefield, even in the battlefield where a person can lose their life at any moment, the salah is still mandated. And there is a salah called Salatul Khawf, which is a special salah. It's, it's part of the regular salahs we pray, but it's performed in a different way. So you perform your dhuhr, you perform your asr, you perform your maghrib, and all the five salahs, but in certain situations of extreme fear, it will be performed in a slightly different way. And this is when there is uh, fighting on the battlefield or anything of that nature. Allah says in the Quran, فَإِذَا قُمْتَ فِيهِمْ فَأَقَمْتَ لَهُمُ الصَّلَاةِ فَلْتَكُمْ طَائِفَةٌ مِنْكُمْ مَعَكَ وَلْيَأْخُذُوا أَسْلِحَتُهُمْ فَإِذَا سَجِلُوا فَلْيَكُونُوا مِنْ وَرَائِكُمْ Until the end of the ayah, Allah says that when you are with them, then establish the salah. And as they are praying, one group will be with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the other group will be standing guard. The other group will be standing guard. And then when that group goes into prostration, then that, then the, and they finish with their prostration, then the other group will come and they will go into their prostration. And there's different ways of praying it. The books of fiqh mention this. This is a sub-chapter in the books of fiqh, Salatul Khawf. Whether the enemy is facing the Qibla, there's a certain way to pray this Salah. If the enemy is not facing the Qibla, there's a certain way of praying the Salah. And this is mentioned in the books of fiqh. But the point of mentioning this is that even in the battlefield, even in the battlefield, the Salah still continues and it still commences. And so we must be very careful with neglecting the Salah. It's the first thing you'll be questioned about on the Day of Judgment. And this is the first and main ingredient for success. And it is also the only thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in actions describes as kufr. The only action, or one of the only actions that Allah describes as leaving it off as, as, as being kufr is the salah. That between a person and kufr and shirk is leaving off the salah. And another hadith of Rasulullah says, salah. That the covenant that we have that is between us and between them, meaning the disbelievers, is the salah. Whoever leaves it off, they have disbelieved. So this is the only action which if you leave it off, Allah describes that action as being an act of disbelief. And it comes in the Quran, it comes in the Quran, when people will be asked on the Day of Judgment, what caused you to enter the fire? مَا سَلَكَكُمْ فِي سَقَرْ What caused you to enter the fire? And the very first answer that comes out of their mouths, قَالُوا لَمْ نَكُمْ مِنَ الْمُصَلِّينَ They said, we were not from those who prayed. We were not from those who prayed. So this salah is the most important pillar and it's not something to take lightly. Leaving it off is putting a person, they're putting your iman at extreme risk. So as we are approaching Ramadan and as we are getting ready for the fasting of Ramadan, let's make sure that our salah is intact. Start from now. Start making sure that you are praying your salah, you're praying it in the way that it should be prayed on time, fulfilling the obligations, fulfilling the uh, the pillars of the salah and performing it in a way that is valid 
أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم فاستغفروه إنه هو الغفور الرحيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين حمدا كثيرا طيبا مباركا فيه كما يحب يحب ربنا ويرضى. The importance of salah is obvious from what we have mentioned in the first khutbah the amount of verses, the amount of hadith, the warnings about those who leave the salah but it is not enough just to go through the motions. When we talk about the salah and praying the salah or establishing the salah, it's not just going through the motions. It is much more than just going through the motions. Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah, he mentions that people are of five levels when it comes to performing the salah. The first level are those who just go through the motions. They just go through the motions. And then level two, level three, level four, level five, all the way we get to the level five are those who pray and they pray with concentration and they fulfill all of the pillars of the salah and they fulfill all the uh, recommended parts of the salah this is the highest level and this is the level in which Rasulullah of course he reached and his companions reach and this is the level where they found comfort in the salah this is the level where you find comfort Rasulullah would say to Bilal Arihna biha ya Bilal comfort us by the salah make, uh, make us at ease by it O Bilal meaning call the adhan so that we can be comforted and we can find tranquility in this salah so this is the level uh, of which Rasulullah reached and his companions reached and which we are trying to reach. And it comes in another hadith, وَجُعِلَتْ قُرَّةُ عَيْنٍ لِقُرَّةُ عَيْنِي فِي الصلاة. That my, the, the coolness of my eyes has been made in the salah. The coolness of my eyes have been made and placed in the salah. So this is the level that we want to reach. Where the salah becomes the thing that brings us calmness and tranquility and peace and on the, the flip side if the salah is burdensome if it is heavy on you then this is not a good sign as Allah says in the Quran وَإِنَّهَا لَكَبِيرَةٌ إِلَّا عَلَى الْخَاشِعِينَ and this salah it is something heavy and it is something burdensome except on the khashirin except on those who are praying their salah with concentration and submissiveness and humbleness so we want to get to that level where we are enjoying the salah and where we are being comforted by the salah and it is not a burden and it is not burdensome and something heavy for us and to get this we need to avoid get to this level the first thing of course we need to learn the fiqh of the salah how to perform the salah what are the prerequisites of the salah what are the things that spoil the salah and avoid some of the mistakes that many of us fall into when it comes to the salah the first of course being ignorant of the ahkam of the salah this is the most important to know how to pray to know how to pray and there are so many resources that we have to where we can learn how to perform the salah what are the things that nullify the salah for example and this is something very common that we always need to uh, point out especially for the brothers the salah one of the things that nullifies the salah is when you are exposing parts of the, uh, the body that should not be exposed. The awrah of the, of the person, of the man in the salah is between his navel and his knees. Between his navels and his knees. And according to many scholars, covering his shoulders. So it's one of the many uh, uh, most common mistakes that many people make, especially those who are praying with pants, is that when they go down into rukur, they go down to sujood, the back is exposed, right? The lower back is exposed. And this can be a nullifier of the salah. So things like this, we need to Make sure that we know what are the things that nullify the salah. Because we can be praying and the salah is invalid because you're doing something that nullifies the salah. Other thing, another thing that we need to avoid is habitually praying late. Habitually praying late. We know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made the salah a beginning time and an end time. And the beginning time is the best. This is the best time to pray it. And you can go all the way until the end. But if you are constantly in that habit of going all the way until the end, what is going to happen? Eventually, you're going to go into that red zone and miss the salah. So it's not a good idea to be into that habit of always praying late. Another thing that we need to avoid is being 
lazy in our salah and not giving each position its due right. Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes the salah of the munafiqeen, the hypocrites. And he says, إِنَّ الْمُنَافِقِينَ يُخَادِعُونَ اللَّهَ وَهُوَ خَادِعُهُمْ وَإِذَا قَامُوا إِلَى الصَّلَاةِ قَابُوا كُسَالًا That the munafiqoon, they try to deceive Allah. But Allah deceives them. And when they stand for the salah, they pray. But they are only praying for show. And they pray, قَامُوا kusala يُرَعُونَ الناس. Right? They pray and they are only praying to, for the people to see them. And they pray very lazily. And they don't give the salah its due right. And we had a very no, well-known hadith in which a man came and he entered the masjid and he prayed. And Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam observed his salah. And he came after the salah and he came and he gave salam to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told him, فصلي فإنك لم تصلي. Go back and pray because you did not pray. And he went back and prayed. And he came once again. And Rasulullah Sallallahu told him the same thing. Go back and pray. You did not pray. And this happened three times. Until the man, he gave up and he said, I don't know anything better, so teach me. And then Rasulullah taught him the integrals of the salah. And one of the things he emphasized was that when you go into each position, make sure that your body is at ease, at rest. That you're not, as soon as you get into ruku' before you can even get at ease and, and, and in, a, in, a, in, a, in a position of stability, you're already coming back up. This is something that we also need to avoid. And from other things we need to avoid when in our salah is also praying in an impro uh, improper state. Praying in an improper state. Whether you are praying with clothes that are impure or clothes that are not respectable or you're praying in an area that is not respectable. These are things that we need to avoid. Allah Azza wa Jalla says in the Quran, Ya ayyuhal ladhin amanu, khudhu zinatakum, ya bani adam, khudhu zinatakum anda kulli masjid. Take your beautification for every, for every masjid. In other words, when, you, when you're coming to the salah, come in the best state. Come in the best state. You're meeting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Try to come in the best state, in the best clothes, and pray in the best uh, area, free from, any, uh, free from any type of filth or any type of impurities. And the last thing, and this is maybe the biggest uh, issue that we all face, is not concentrating in the salah. And this is the greatest test that all of us have, which is trying to get that concentration in the salah. And this is what Allah says in the Quran, الَّذِينَ هُمْ فِي صَلَاتِهِمْ خَاشِعُونَ They are those who, in their salah, they are concentrated. They are concentrated. And the shaitan attacks us in this way, tries to ruin our concentration. And in the hadith, it's mentioned that there's a specific shaitan that his only job is to distract you in the salah. A companion once came and he uh, complained that I'm being distracted in my salah. I cannot concentrate. And Rasulullah told him that this is a, a shaitan. This is a shaitan and he has been assigned just to make you lose your concentration in the salah. So this is something that we have to continue to uh, struggle with ourselves to get to that point where we are able to concentrate in the salah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make this uh, a reality for us that we can get to that level of being able to concentrate where the salah becomes the coolness of our eyes. And where, as Rasulullah says to Bilal, Arihna biha ya Bilal, where the salah is something that we find tranquility and peace and calmness in. So as we approach the month of Ramadan once again, and we are going to be concentrating on the fasting, make sure as, as we go into Ramadan that your salah is in order. Make sure that your salah is in order. Make sure that you are praying all of the salawat on the, in time. Come to the masjid if you are able to. Join the classes if you, you don't know how to perform the salah. These are very important things. We don't want to come into the Ramadan and only thing we're getting out of it is losing our food, and losing our drink and becoming hungry and thirsty and we're not gaining anything from it. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us from amongst those who establish the salah. To make us from amongst those who always perform the salah in the correct and appropriate manner. Allahumma ameen. ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار ربنا ظلمنا أنفسنا وإن لم تغفر لنا وترحمنا لنكونن من الخاسرين ربنا تقبل منا إنك أنت السميع العليم وتب علينا إنك أنت التواب الرحيم ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار اللهم اغفر للمسلمين والمسلمات والمؤمنين والمؤمنات الأحياء منهم والأمات إنك سميع مجيب الدعوات برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم عز الإسلام والمسلمين 
وأذل الشرك والمشركين ودمر أعداء الدين اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد عباد الله رحمكم الله إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإتاء ذي القربى وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعيذكم لعلكم تذكرون فاذكروا الله يذكركم وادعوه يستجب لكم ولا ذكر الله أكبر والله يعلم ما تصنعون أقيم الصلاة Thank <laughs> you.